What if I were to tell you that there is a comic book that has Red Hood and Arsenal teaming up, taking jobs for hire like mercenaries, but trying to be superheroes? That's what we're going to be covering today in today's full story. This is the channel Comic Story, where I take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and I break them down into digestible bites and then I read them back to you dramatically, allowing you to keep up on your favorite comic books, superheroes, and the world of interesting graphic novels. And today we're going to be doing one of our full story videos. You see, comic books come out on a monthly basis for the most part. And due to that, storylines can take 6 to 12 months to conclude and we make individual videos here on the channel. Well, once those are all done, we have a very massive playlist, and sometimes it's a little difficult for you guys to find the individual videos to tell the full story. Hence the name of this video, Full Story. I take all the videos in a playlist and we put it together as just one big video. Over the course of a year, back in an era in DC known as DCU, they ended the Red Hood and the Outlaw storyline for the New 52, and they did a 12-issue run in which Red Hood and Arsenal teamed up. They then ended that and went into Red Hood Rebirth, but today we're going to bring you the 12 issue run of Red Hood and Arsenal as a full story. This will help conclude the entirety of the history of Red Hood, and I'll tell you where it fits in a little bit better at the end of this. This is Arsenal. He used to be one third of the Outlaws, a group that was operated by Jason Todd, aka the Red Hood. They weren't a group of villains or anything, they just did things how they thought it should be done. And right now, he's sitting on a crate of arrows alone. He misses his old team, with Starfire heading off to Miami to be alone, and Jason, well, no one really knows where Jason went. But anyway, back to the mission on hand. Arsenal calls up Tara Battleworth as she walks out onto the field. She doesn't want to hear it. She wants to talk to Arsenal's boss. Boss? Jason was never the boss, he thinks to himself. And that's when another car pulls up, and a rather bulky individual gets out and tells Tara Battleworth to present the man or the money. So the senator steps out of his car and laughing. I told you, Miss Battleworth, there's no need for this cloak and dagger stuff. The elderly man walks over to the large man and he grabs the old man by the wrist. There's been a change in plans, old man. Arsenal smiles. Yes, there has been. And he fires an explosive arrow into the car of these individuals. With a ba 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 doom it throws everyone back. So Arsenal fires a blinding arrow into the field, and he jumps in to start his assault. He fires arrows and he kicks his enemies until the CIA agents finally ask, What? How? He proudly tells them, I'm Arsenal, also not known as Arrowboy. The CIA agent tells him, Oh, right, didn't recognize you without the Red Hood. Oh, come on, it's not like we're married. I don't need him to save a senator from... But before he can finish his sentence, the senator drops from gunshots to his back. And then the head honcho grabs Tara Battleworth to use her as a hostage. Arsenal holds his hands to give up. When the senator rolls over and he opens fire on them. Okay, didn't see that anywhere in the program. The senator blasts the guy in the chest, dropping him and saving Miss Battleworth. Didn't ask for your help, Arsenal yells at him. You two know each other, Miss Battleworth asks. So the senator drops his hologram, and he reveals that it was Red Hood the whole time. With the job done, they argue for a second as to why Arsenal left the group last time, but Red Hood asks him, So what's it gonna be, Arsenal? You done crying about the girl and ready to get back into action? Yeah, I'm ready. The next day after burning Jason's shower curtains off, Arsenal explains that he spent all of their money on some nifty new gadgets. So to get some new money, they take an offer that was made to them by Tara Battleworth to assist her in keeping the rich and famous of Washington's problems silent. Their first job takes them to Paris, France, and their job is to recover a thumb drive stolen by a diplomat. They're gonna do this as silently as they can. So while Roy is trying to make some new female friends, Jason thinks that they should stick to business, and he has a list of things for them to do while they're in Paris. Like fight bad guys, boss levels to beat, coins to collect, you really need to cut back on the video games, Roy. But, yeah. And with that, the Red Hood and Arsenal video game begins. Level 1, Red Hood battles against various Parisian terrorists. Level 2 is an arms dealer and a level up. And level 3 is Arsenal's favorite, the Monster Ninja People. Thank you for playing the Superhero Bros World 1. As they stand over the defeated enemies with Red Hood's guns smoking, Arsenal asks him, If you tell me that didn't feel like a video game, I'm gonna call you a liar. Eerily so. But that's when the boys get a phone call from Tara Battleworth. What are you two doing? I hired you to get a thumb drive, not have a streetwide tourist brawl. Save your threats, we're gonna get some dinner and then we'll get your thumb drive. Hood tells her as he hangs up. The two head off to dinner at the Eiffel Tower and Roy tries to pretend that he doesn't know why they're there. 
a notorious shade scientist is sitting across from them. And they're still on Jason's list of things to do while he's in Paris. As the scientist tries to get a little angry with the woman, Jason gets up and he punches him in the throat. Which gets all of the lackeys to jump through the window. Roy reaches for his duffel bag to suit up while Jason is being slapped around by the mime squad. Now can I just say one thing, Jason? When don't you say one thing? Just imagine if we were getting paid to fight these bad guys and helping people, instead of giving it away for free. Oh, and do you feel that? Which that? Like it's another montage coming on. Welcome to Mime Melee. Choose your hero. Red Hood with his ex-Robin angst attack, Arsenal with his trucker hat attack, or Allison with the Mime This Attack. Ready, fight! This time, the guys feel like they're fighting it out on a platformer using all of their weapons to save poor Allison. Her Mime This Attack isn't very effective. With the final villain on his list of people to beat up while in Paris done, Jason and Roy head off to get the thumb drive, which is so uninteresting that we're gonna keep it off panel. Then they return to Terra Battleworth, which locks them into her list of wet work operatives with paying jobs. Jason and Arsenal drop the money in the bank and then get ready for their next paying job. You know I'm gonna kill you when this is all over, right, Roy? Trained professionals should not threaten to kill people. Who's threatening? See, you think it's funny, but it just comes off as mean, Jason. Our story begins with Red Hood falling out of a building. Arsenal literally fires an arrow into his shoulder to catch him, and once it goes taunt, he screams out in pain. This is your idea of a rescue, Roy? It worked, didn't it? Then Red Hood hears the crowd below. Go Bat Guy! We love you! Red Bat rocks! I'd hire you! Is that crowd down below cheering for us? Red Hood asks. Well, they could be cheering for something else entirely, something I've been meaning to tell you about. That's when Jason Todd, the Red Hood, sees the newest billboard. Rent a bat, call now! 555 Red Arse. Their government contracts burst into their office crazy mad at them. Are you two out of your minds? I hired you because my clients want discretion. Now everyone knows who you are. And as Tara Battleworth leaves the room, Jason turns to Roy. Just tell me why it's so important that we make more money, Roy. Well, a national campaign costs a lot of money. Ah, oh, geez, this is my fault for allowing you to open up a joint banking account, Jason says as he face palms. Roy's plan does work though, and their first offer brings them to an old broken down house, with their first client being a rather large, disgusting looking person named Underbelly. He explains that he is thought made man, the corruption that runs through every major city in the world, the living embodiment of greed, sloth, envy, and murder. And he wants to hire Red Hood and Arsenal as his new enforcers. Red Hood stops him right there. Yeah, it's not just that easy. We don't just work for anyone. And Arsenal looks a little confused. We don't? Then Red Hood opens fire, completely destroying Underbelly. And he walks away. Arsenal flips out on him. Jason, you can't just kill every client that annoys you. This is why the freelance business was a bad idea, Roy. Every villain scumbag weirdo in the world has a direct line to us. I think he's twitching, Jason. Then Underbelly's goo begins to reform as his hands grab Red Hood and throw him into a wall. You weren't paying attention. I can't be killed any more than you can kill a thought. If you will not serve me, you will die, thunk. Did you just say thunk? No, wasn't I. It was me, Arsenal shouts from a distance, and then Underbelly explodes again. It's going to take him a bit to reform from that. You know, Roy, you're wrong. If we didn't make that ad, we would never have found this guy. Maybe we can use this business to lure out more people like him. You had me and I was wrong. So if we're gonna shut him down for good, we're gonna need to find the center of his operation. And I've got a hunch where we should start. The most vile and crime-ridden pit of despair and debauchery. Or, as you call it, Gotham, home sweet home. Well, they both did some things in Gotham that needed to be done, like Jason meeting with some people who were in a bad way like he was, and Roy talking to an old friend named Croc who also has a drinking problem, like Roy did. Eventually, Jason shot out one of the cameras linked to the Batman balloon, and the Jim Gordon Robo Batman looks at the screen. Great. Get the suit ready. But back down on the streets below, Roy rides up on a new motorcycle asking Jason, what's with the dump nearby? And Jason tells him, this is where he thinks Underbelly is. You see, five years ago, this dump was the crown jewel of this hood, an exclusive club where all the crooks would go. The Joker was in there telling his latest plan to all of Gotham's other top crooks, and they were interrupted by a poor man that wasn't aware that they were there. The Joker opened fire on him with so many bullets that the man turned into a pile of mush. And that was when Batman and Robin showed up, Jason Todd Robin. They took out the Joker and they never really found out why the Joker called everyone there, and that the poor guy was left as a pile of mush. 
and that's when back in our current day, the robo-suit Batman, that is Jim Gordon, comes in in an attempt to arrest Red Hood and Arsenal for a multitude of things on their rap sheets. They launch out some smoke clogging up Batman's sensors and then Arsenal kicks him, telling him to say goodnight, robo-dork. Arsenal said that not me, Jason told him as he dove into Batman. Batman just throws the two of them aside. Did either of you really think that that would work? And that's when Underbelly comes walking out of his hideout, clapping. Friend of yours? Batman, Underbelly. Underbelly, Batman. Batman opens his attacks with sonic blasters on Underbelly, breaking him apart. And then Arsenal turns to Red Hood. These sonic blasters that Batman has are great! I so need to build me one of these suits. And Red Hood replies with, I can't hear you, but I'm certain you're saying something stupid. Jason then asks Batman if he thinks that was a little overkill. And Batman explains that the GCPD has actually been tracking Underbelly for a while, and they knew how to take him down. But while Batman is explaining, Arsenal is counting. Three, two, because Underbelly is reforming on one. Underbelly opens with a massive fist hitting Batman and taking him out. And then he turns to our two idiot former sidekicks. Gentlemen, you made great effort to find me. Have you reconsidered my offer? Not at all. Yeah, we're here to kill you for reals this time. Underbelly laughs and he tells them, you can't kill a thought. You see, the Joker stole a device that will trap psychic energy and he never got to use it. So once everyone cleared out of the club, the device took on the body of the janitor and it turned it into the underbelly. The very idea of evil. It took him years, but the evil in the air of Gotham built him up and made him fatter until he was able to branch out. But while he was giving his monologue evil speech, Batman is recovered and he jumps in clobbering Underbelly and then repeatedly beating on him to tear him apart. Who are we rooting for, Jason? If you boys aren't a part of the solution, then you're a part of the problem, Batman yells at them, flinging various bits of Underbelly at them. Jason jumps onto Batman's back while Roy runs off for plan B. Well, while Jason tries to guess what that is, he opens fire on Underbelly until Underbelly grabs both Batman and Red Hood and he picks them up ready to kill them. But out of the blue, an arrow fires through his midsection and it begins to truly disrupt him. My beautiful body. Beautiful? There's someone for everyone. And while they recover from being picked up, Arsenal cheers himself on. Well, since no one is going to applaud, I'll do it. That was awesome, Arsenal. Total boss move. Sure, he's great, but is he like that in real life? Oh, and for the record, that arrow was built to disrupt neural functions. So I killed him for good this time. And then all three of them stare at each other. Batman doesn't want them in his town. He isn't the old Batman and he doesn't work with vigilantes. So Jason promises that in exchange for helping him, they'll leave by noon tomorrow, no more bloodshed. And Batman agrees. Jason spends the next morning visiting an old friend, Bruce Wayne, to let him know that the place he's working at now has helped out a lot of kids. And then he hugged Bruce Wayne. Bruce has some form of amnesia and he has no idea who Jason is. But just knowing that Bruce is alive makes Jason feel better. And then he thanks Bruce for everything before leaving. Meanwhile, Arsenal is deciding that maybe he can move past his alcoholic past, just as Joker's daughter shoots him in the head. She now stands over him, victorious, explaining to Pallet and Susie Sue that she was the one to kill Arsenal, and now she's gonna go kill the Red Hood. The only thing that she wants is entry into their supervillain group, and their response is, who are you? None of your business, but you can call me Joker's daughter. So they let her go off to kill Red Hood as she asks, because as Pallet explains, if they have this girl do all of their work for them, then their first job is complete and they didn't even have to do anything. Jason, meanwhile, is sitting in an airplane on the tarmac of the Gotham City Airport, checking his phone. Why hasn't Roy answered his calls, or at least texted his location? As the plane begins to take off, a woman shrieks the sight on the wing, and Jason looks out to see Joker's daughter on the wing with a chainsaw. Knowing what this means, he kicks the door open and jumps onto the wing to battle against her. She starts swinging the chainsaw around and digs it into the wing, and the damage and speed of the plane tilt the plane. As she's about to fall off, Jason grabs her hand. You've got me, sure, but will you still have me when you learn that I splattered Arsenal's brains on the rooftop? No, it'll be more like, die, jerk, die! And then she pulls out a gun while Jason tries to process that. Roy, dead? Someday, but never by this kid. Over with Susie Sue, she's standing over the apparently dead body of Arsenal, stating that she can use his bow and arrow. It shouldn't be that hard to pull a bow, right? And then an arrow goes through the back of her neck. It's not a bow, it's an arrow. Roy says getting back up, and he rubs the back of his head and he realizes that he was shot with a paintball filled with someone's guts. Joker's daughter's twisted. Back on the plane, Jason can tell that she's not really trying to kill him. I mean, she is, but she's got no heart in it. And he begins to wonder, what's her story? They've both had their heads messed with by the Joker, and he remembers how when he first came back to Gotham, he was full of piss and vinegar. So he wonders, is she crazier than he was? The plane comes to a sudden halt, and he drops her on the tarmac. Then she makes a break for it. 
back with Roy. He walks into the terrorist base and he comes across one of the goons, smacking him upside the head, dropping him. Roy then flips over, lodges an arrow into the guy's foot, and then he sticks one into the guy's chest, dropping him. Joker's daughter gets back to the base and explains to Pallet that she didn't stand a chance against Red Hood. He was just too good! And unhappy with this, Pallet tells her goons to kill Joker's daughter. Joker's daughter calls out, but why? Why would you want to kill them so badly anyway? Pilot explains that she doesn't. It's business. They were working for Terra Battleworth and then they made their own business. That was Pilot's plan. And with them there, there's no use for her. So she's removing the competition. And then she turns back to Joker's daughter. And don't you think that I can tell that you are faking your fear? Joker's daughter laughs. <laughs> In my defense, I made a very convincing evergreen tree number three when I was in second grade for Christmas. Pallet begins to charge up her powers, but at that moment, Red Hood leaps in, firing his guns at all of Pallet's goons, dropping them. Then Arsenal throws an arrow into the back of Pallet's neck, and Joker's daughter exclaims, Wow! Aren't we a great team? Oddly enough, none of them died, and Red Hood and Arsenal packaged them all up in a crate to send them off to sea for six weeks. Joker's daughter asks, wouldn't it be easier to kill them? And Roy agrees, and even states that it's not like Red Hood is known for his non-violent resolutions. Jason stops him there. That was before. Before I joined? Joker's daughter asks. Yes, now Arsenal and I need to set an example for you. Roy wants to know, why would they hire Joker's daughter? And Jason tells him, your whole renobat thing was to clean up our image, right? Why not let three people clean up their image instead of two? Joker's daughter asks, full dental? And that's how she joined up with Jason and Roy. As Arsenal and Joker's daughter sit on top of a building, Red Hood tells them that he has some things that he's going to go follow up on, and they shouldn't follow him. He runs off to be a part of the Robin Wars, and that video will be down below. But Joker's daughter suggests that Arsenal and her follow him anyway. Arsenal tells her no. Red Hood cares about her, so for whatever reason, he needs to care by proxy. Later, while Joker's daughter is getting a drink off of the water tower's water, Arsenal gets a call for their business rent a someone asking for help rescuing some orphans at a circus. So, he takes Joker's daughter and they set off on the job, and Joker's daughter couldn't be more than happy to do something finally. She was getting really bored. When they finally arrive at the circus, Arsenal hears his phone go off that the client's money has already cleared his PayBud account. Now, they just need to find whoever it is that they need to beat up. Joker's daughter points and says, I guess it's over there, where all the people are running and screaming from. When Arsenal looks over, he sees Phosphorus Rex, Big Top, and Siam. Arsenal begins to run in and tells Joker's daughter to stay, and she barks in reply, Woof! While Rex is speaking with Big Top, Arsenal jumps in shooting an asbestos foam arrow at Rex and Siam, covering both of them so that they can't move. But just as Arsenal is thinking that that was a little too easy, he hears Joker's daughter call out to him to look behind him. But before he can react, Big Top jumps on top of him. Joker's daughter watches and tells Arsenal that it's a real honor to watch him work. And he tells her, fine, sicker. Just then, Joker's daughter leaps from the popcorn machine that she was on and cracks Big Top in the head with a wheel from the machine. She then turns when she hears a voice yell at her, how dare you? Rex begins to yell that they are the Circus of the Strange, and he shoots fire at Joker's daughter, having her jump over Big Top, causing Big Top to take the fire. She then throws the broken wheel at Rex, impaling him and knocking him out. Arsenal draws his bow on Joker's daughter and tells her, heal, and she tells him that he's really big on the dog metaphors, and it's a little sexist. She then points her gun down at the people that they just dropped, telling Arsenal that she wished she could have been good, but that's just not who she is. Arsenal tells her, were because if she pulls that trigger, she will be a whir, and Joker's daughter closes her eyes and says that she's sorry. A short while later, Arsenal decides that it might be best to drop Joker's daughter off, and Joker's daughter begins to wake up asking what happened. Arsenal tells her that he tased her with a few thousand volts, and she tries to tell him that she wasn't gonna shoot. Red Hood believes in her, which makes her want to believe in herself. Arsenal frees Joker's daughter, and he thinks to himself how he might be regretting this later, but before anything else can happen, creatures begin to start crawling up from the ground, and they look like zombies covered in lava. And Joker's daughter says that they're dwellers, mindless subhumans who live in the rock-bottom lava beds underneath Gotham. A short time later, Red Hood appears to meet up with them, and he notices that Arsenal's bike is melted to the ground. Man, this can't be good. Much later, Arsenal is being tortured and being asked how he knows Joker's daughter, and the woman tells him that she was sent by Sharon to know about those who signed with Joker's daughter. As they pull him out of a tank of ice water, she asks again, but Arsenal tells her that Joker's daughter is not his friend, just a friend of a friend, and this is the part where you guys are supposed to tell me where she is. And the woman asks, or what? And Arsenal tells her, well, spoiler, I'm gonna kick your asses. As the two thugs begin to walk to him, Arsenal breaks free, knocking the thugs out, and then he wraps the chain around the woman, asking again, so where's Joker's daughter? 
Elsewhere in the Nethers, Joker's daughter finds herself chained up, and Sharon asks her how she once took away everything from him. Joker's daughter tells him that she is implosive like that. Kids, huh? But it doesn't matter. Those people are now her people, and she beats him in battle. Sharon tells her that it doesn't matter. He has a new tribe now, and they are going to drag Gotham into the fiery rivers of purification. As more of the dwellers start to crawl out of the ground, Joker's daughter lets out a small eep. Arsenal continues to try and look for Joker's daughter, but he finds himself starting to get surrounded by these dwellers. And he tells them, no touchies. The whole burning lava hands thing kind of hurts. So just point and he'll go. Back below, Sharon begins to have these dwellers push down the pillars that hold up Gotham, allowing everything to come falling down into this lava. And Joker's daughter tells him, hey, inflicting a little pain is fun, but this is millions of people. Sharon tells her that that is because of her. He was cast out from those people. And though he almost died, he found these dwellers and they began to follow his words. Joker's daughter begins to think that this is her fault. But before she can talk anymore, Arsenal is thrown into the pit where she is chained. So rude, Arsenal says. Joker's daughter asks if he came back for her and he tells her yes, she's essentially company property. Joker's daughter stares at him and asks if that's the only reason. And he tells her, for someone called Joker's daughter, you're a little humor impaired. As Arsenal begins to free Joker's daughter, Red Hood comes crashing down through the ceiling. See, they knew they needed him. Arsenal looks at him and tells him, I notice your guns are gone. You can go ahead and use the arrow gun. Just don't give me a hard time about it. Joker's daughter walks over to them and tells them, no, this is her fight. It's between her and Sharon. Joker's daughter then walks over to him and tells him that neither of them belong here, not as leader, not even as people. But she wanted to say, sorry. She extends her hand to give him a handshake and asks him if he's ready. And he asks for what? And Joker's daughter pulls his arm, pulling both of them down to the pit of lava. She comes closer and closer to the lava, so Arsenal fires a hook that grabs Joker's daughter by the hand before pulling her back in. When she comes back up, she asks, why did he do that? And Arsenal tells her, I don't know, killing herself is stupid. Red Hood grabs her and tells her that he won't let her go until things get better. And they will. He promises. Later, Joker's daughter decides to leave behind the mask, the Joker's skin mask, because the people down here can do better than her as a leader or even Sharon. But as Arsenal begins to walk out, he notices a figure, just as it begins to vanish. Arsenal was suggesting that they lead the people of the underground to the top, but Joker's daughter tells him, leadership is pretty overrated anyways, and Arsenal agrees. Red Hood then asks Arsenal, what would you know? When have you ever led anyone? But he has. He led Iron Rule, the group that Red Hood fought to get down here. As Jason and Roy find themselves in a firefight against Hive operatives aboard the USS Excelsior, Roy can only think about one thing. Wearing white is kind of empowering. The two continue to fight off the Hive agents when they begin to hear a siren go off, signaling that everyone up top needs to go down below. Jason says at least everyone knows that they're down here now, and Roy's concern is that they kind of may get shot along with the terrorists. Roy tells him only one problem though. First, Roy needs to disarm the bomb on this Navy vessel. And as Roy turns to look at the bomb, he states, oh, yeah, about that. Jason looks back at him and he sees it along with Roy. That's a giant bomb. Do you think you can defuse it? And Roy tells him, nope. I mean, sure, no problem, but mostly no. However, our story doesn't begin there. Five hours earlier, Jason and Roy went to visit Tara Battleworth regarding their new addition to their team, Joker's Daughter. Tara tells him that having JD along with them is probably not the best thing they could do for their new business, but as long as JD can pass the exam with the doctor that Tara has set up for them, she'll help them out. But while JD is off being evaluated, Roy received a call about a local job and decided that he and Jason should go check it out while they're trying to kill time. The two meet up with Noelle, a woman that works as an analyst for the USS Excelsior, and she explains a call that she received recently. Someone contacted her from some group called Hive about a job. Jason asks her why doesn't she tell the Navy, but she says that the man also said that they had infiltrated the ranks of the Navy, and she didn't know who else she could call. She then goes on to state that the man said that whatever was going to happen was going to happen soon, maybe even today. So Jason tells her that this really isn't much that they can work off of, but Roy tells her they're going to take the job. Later, Jason and Roy snuck into the Pentagon because Jason wanted to check out how reliable their client was, and as they walked through the scanners, the two guards welcomed Colonel Clink and Admiral Worf, and Roy was surprised at how well that worked. And Jason tells him, remember that guy I worked with? Batman? Thus, that's how they got on the boat with the Hive agents all over them. Jason continues to fight off the oncoming Hive agents while Roy continues to work on the bomb. And Jason says that he wished that he knew at least what kind of bomb they were working with. And among the fallen Hive agents, one stands up and tells Jason that all he had to do was ask, imagine a dirty bomb, but instead of radiation, think of one that would embed the thoughts and schemes of all of the brilliant minds of Hive's most brilliant minds. Now imagine that bomb going off on the graduating class of an entire battalion of American soldiers. And Jason tells the man, no thanks, I'm not that imaginative. 
alive. As the man begins to lean towards Jason, he then sees that the bomb has been turned off, and Jason looks to see Roy has just hit the council with a bunch of his arrows a bunch of times. Jason then tells the Hive agent, looks like you just got pwned by a guy that wears trucker hats. Right! I mean, hey! Roy says. But while JD is being given the okay by the doctors, JD leaves and jumps into a lake and she swims. When she comes back up, she says, hello, daddy, and she puts on the Joker mask, stating that anything daddy can do, she can do better, darker, and sicker. Later, back home, Roy begins to wake up from a nightmare, one that he's been having a lot more often. He remembers the time that he had to leave his mercenary group, the Iron Rule, having to let them die for losing their way by calling an airstrike on them. But why is he thinking about them now? Maybe it's because when he was down in the nethers rescuing JD, the man that he saw was a man named Everest, and he was with Iron Rule. Of course, this makes Roy realize that they're back. Elsewhere, Jason and JD go have a talk about how the doctor visit went, and how JD is looking forward to this fresh new start in her life. Jason tells her that Roy and Tara think that she's crazy, and he asks if she's sure she's ready, to which she replies, absolutely. Jason then begins to tell JD a story. His mother used to smoke, but his father used to hit her for it, and his mother could never understand how he would always find out. Well, it's because she used to smell. She never noticed it. He then reaches into his coat, and he pulls out the Joker mask that JD took back, and asks, does she know how bad the sewage-treated human flesh mask smells? The only thing Jason wants to know if this was all a lie from day one, and JD tells him no, but that's when she begins to laugh. <laughs> she then asks if he minds if she puts it back on, and then she tries to hug Jason, telling them not to fight. She shoves him back, taking his gun and pointing it right at his head, and she tells him to join her. Together they can burn Gotham to the ground, and he tells her he's sorry. She begins to ask for what as she begins to open fire on him, and he knocks the gun away from her and then kicks her off the goalpost that they were sitting on. As she lands, Jason fires one shot, hitting JD. She looks up bloodied and tells him, You shot me! Awesome! Jason then tells her that if it isn't obvious, she's fired. And back in the city, Roy begins to look for clues as to where Iron Rule may be hiding out. But as he walks down an alley, he begins to feel something, like he's being watched. And as he turns to draw his bow, he asks how he could not have seen this coming, when above him, stood Iron Rule, infected and changed from the radiation from the airstrike bomb that he called on them long ago. With Iron Rule capturing Roy and bringing him to the edge of death, they have one question for the internet as they stream the torture. Should Roy live or die? And the votes begin to come in, and everyone voted to die. With JD being shot, Jason stands by when he gets a call from Barbara Gordon, informing him of Roy's internet situation. But as Jason begins to leave to find Roy, the ambulance with JD begins to head towards the hospital. As the ambulance drives down the road, a hand reaches out of the sewer, knocking over all of the cars, and the ambulance flips over. As JD sits up in the tipped over ambulance, she begins to yell out, again, again! But from the outside, Everest helps JD out, asking, you okay, boss? As she tells him, never better, but it would have been nice to have been rescued before getting shot. Back with Jason, he begins to search Roy's place for some clues as to where Iron Rule may have taken him. Jason then begins to find something that Roy crafted, something called a boomerang arrow. And with this, he'll be able to find Roy's quiver. As Jason begins to follow the signal back to his quiver, he notices a box with a biohazard symbol on it. And if this is what Jason thinks it is, it may have just saved his life. But back with Roy, he begins to wake up and the first thing that he sees is JD. Roy asks her how she found him. Furthermore, be careful because Iron Rule is over. But JD cuts him off, telling him that they are no match for the two of them. Let's get you out of here, Roy. Roy tells her, thank God that he was wrong about her and she stops him. Psych! Roy looks down to see JD holding a gun at Tara Battleworth's head. Roy tells her to let her go. She's not a part of this, but JD tells him that he's wrong. She very much is. She made Roy and Jason into respectable men, but the truth is, they are just as bad as JD. But before JD can pull the trigger, Jason appears on the screens around them, telling them all that they have five seconds to give up, and he begins counting down to one. As he counts to one, the lights go out, and JD begins to laugh. <laughs> and then she asks, is it me, or did it just get really hot in here? Everest begins to call out to Jason as he puts his hand closer to Roy, and then Everest is shot with an arrow, and Roy looks at him. Uh oh Everest yells that he's basically a walking nuclear power plant. So what is this little arrow supposed to do? And Roy closes his eyes and begins to count backwards, when suddenly a small explosion goes off, and Everest begins to melt away. Roy yells that those arrows were supposed to put out nuclear energy, not be used on people. But one by one, Jason begins to shoot the rest of Iron Rule at them until only B is left. B quickly unties Roy and states that he's free, and Roy tells Jason not to kill her. The only reason that they are this way is because of him. And Jason tells Roy that he did his fair share of bad things, but nothing compared to them. As Jason holds the bow to her, Roy states that they are better than this. And Jason tells him, you're better than this. I, however, am not. Roy then elbows B, knocking her out and asks, Now what? You're not gonna shoot her while she's unconscious. And Roy's right. 
So Jason puts the bow down and states, fine, you win. But she does go to jail. Then JD appears in the monitors telling the internet, oh my God, these two are so adorable. I almost don't want to kill them. Jason then turns his gun to JD while she holds a gun down on Tara and tells her that he was being nice shooting her in the shoulder before. Next time it's gonna be between her eyes. And Roy tells everyone to put their guns down. But while Jason and JD continue to talk, Roy shoots JD with a taser arrow knocking her out. Roy then looks back at Jason and he asks him, what the hell was that? Talk about overkill. You just killed four people with the world watching. No one is gonna hire us again. Jason tells him to grow up. Over 300,000 people you don't know just voted to kill you for fun because they could. Do you really think I give a damn what they think about us or me? Jason turns to the camera and he tells everyone the show's over and he shoots out the camera. Jason then goes on to state that this whole thing was never going to work. This thing with them. Roy has too much faith in people while Jason doesn't have any in people. Before leaving, Jason tells him that he won't ever be the hero that Roy wants him to be, but he will be the hero that Jason knows that he is. And he walks off to leave Roy to think about what to do next. And there you guys have it, a short full story because it only went for 12 issues and all of the issues were relatively short in general. So basically the way it goes is Under the Red Hood, Red Hood Lost Days, Red Hood New 52, Red Hood and Arsenal, Red Hood Rebirth, and then all the Rebirth ones. I think we had three full stories for that. I'm going to put them into a full playlist. You guys can just watch them all back to back to back and really know the full story of Red Hood. And maybe one day, if I'm feeling like, I guess, really lazy and I just want to put out a video we already did, I'll put all the Red Hood videos into one giant eight-hour epic. It'll be crazy. Maybe you guys will watch it. I doubt it. Anyway, thank you guys so much for your support. I'll see you next time right here at the Comic Story Channel.